Well, let's get right into some XFL recap because I think XFL is our number one topic on this podcast already. Yeah, we love our XFL. Even, even though our Dragons aren't doing too well. But well, we'll get into the score recap here. First off, Houston Roughnecks beat the Tampa Bay Vipers 34 to 27. Next up, the Dallas Renegades beat our Seattle Dragons 24 to 12. That and was on painful. Sunday, yeah, it was painful. On Sunday, the St. Louis Battlehawks in the with the first football in St. Louis in a little while beat the New York Guardians 29 to 9. And then in the shocker of the weekend, the LA Wildcats beat the DC Defenders 39 to 9. So, what are your thoughts on this weekend, Chris? You know, the big thing was watching the start of that LA Wildcat game and this was a totally different team um johnson was on it right at the start they got that touchdown early and then right after they uh cardell jones threw a pick and uh and the wildcats got the ball back and and they just were so hot right off the gate there was no stopping them this is a completely different wildcats well, team you know they were saying they were talking before like we're, we've we've worked it out in practice we really changed it around and to go up against a, such a good team and the undefeated up until that point, DC defenders, that really shocked me. I mean, too, what was wrong with Cardale Jones? He had four interceptions, looked horrible. Yeah, that's a, that's another big story. Like, Cardale Jones has been one of the more solid quarterbacks. You know, in this talk of, like, the big news in the XFL the last few weeks has been the quarterback play has been weak. Cardale Jones has not been a part of that conversation. But, you know, this week he really looked like an XFL quarterback, that's for sure. Mm-hmm. And in some of the other games here, I mean, P.J. Walker, the Houston Roughnecks, he just keeps rolling. I think, I mean, a couple more games like this, he's soon going to be running away with MVP of the league. Oh, yeah, for sure. He he has just been so solid. And, you know, the big story from that game for me is it's less about P.J. Walker because, I mean, we come to expect this. Even after a couple of weeks, like, we've come to expect this from P.J. Walker. But what I did not expect was the Vipers to put up 27 points. It just And that just speaks to... P.J. Walker's just acumen as a quarterback that his defense can give up 27 points and he can still squeak away a pretty comfortable victory. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's nice to see the Tampa Bay Vipers are actually starting to be competitive because again, in, in an eight-team league, you need it to be some competitive parity across this, across all teams. And especially with the um, the Guardians kind of falling flat in the last couple of weeks, mm -hmm. um, you know, it, it really makes the the East very hollow up until this week when the the vipers kind of came out out of the gate really strong you know um right now it's it, it's looking like the battle hawks roughnecks are, are taking that top two playoff spots and it's no contest right now the way the vipers and the gardens have been playing so i'm really excited at the prospect of a, of a of a vipers team that can actually score the ball um that's it was nice it was refreshing and and i can't wait to see them up against a team that's not the houston roughnecks to see how they do now a question i have for you brad is mm -hmm. i know the Guardians beat the Vipers pretty handedly week one. But as of week three, who's the better team? It's a good question. Um, I, I mean, the Guardians got that win and the Vipers don't. But mm -hmm. if you're going trend-wise, the Guardians are trending way down. The Vipers are going up. So I think you'd have to maybe swing it to the Vipers' way, especially the way just Matt McGloin's looked. And mm -hmm. the Vipers, their quarterbacks are, are starting to get better where – the Guardians, Matt McGloin just looks lost, and there's a lot more dysfunction in that franchise. Mm -hmm. But that's, that's a tough question. I think I think we need next week's games to see. Yeah, for sure. And I and I think two teams that are on the upward trend trend are the uh, Wildcats and the Vipers. So I can't wait to see them. Vipers going up against the DC Defenders next week, who obviously struggled this week uh, against the LA Wildcats. So really, if you're the Vipers, a division rival, really the at the top of the division, it, it'd be interesting to see how they come out, out of the gate. Um, the Guardians are up against the Wildcats, and that's going to be a really interesting game too because the, the Guardians really got to get their act together um, because this season runs away from you pretty quick, being only 10 games, and the Wildcats are, are on, on the up. And uh, if, you're, if you're the Wildcats and, and you've just played a good week three game and you're going up against a very weak defense and a weak quarterback in the uh, against the New York Guardians, you're chomping at the bit for this game. Mm -hmm. um, you're starting off Saturday, 2, two o'clock p.m. You're going to start off the weekend for the XFL. Um, I think the Wildcats are really ready to make a statement in this game against the Guardians. 
Mm-hmm. And also, St. Louis getting their first home football since the Rams left, and they really showed up. The, oh, yeah. The crowd was packed. They were loud. It, it was really nice to see for St. Louis. Yeah, and we've seen like an interesting balance between teams that have struggled to fill the fill the bleachers. Obviously, the upper bowls are, are not even being sold, but even like in some of these games, like L.A., not great numbers. Uh, D.C. hasn't had too great numbers. Um, but we've had some big um, packed arenas, you know, in, in this Battle Hawks game. The Seattle Dragons have really sold out CenturyLink Field. Like, um, and that's exciting. And, and St. Louis is such a big football town. It's such a shame that they lost their team so long ago. And, and, and if you're a St. Louis fan, oh, man, you're, you're really happy to see football play, being played in your city again. I, I agree. And two, the one thing is, how much of an advantage are these teams like Seattle and St. Louis going to get over a course of a season with this home field advantage? Because mm-hmm. it, it, it does matter. Yeah, and especially with these guys, think about the experience that's on the field, right? A lot of these guys haven't had experience in big packed arenas. You know, they're playing mm-hmm. uh, D2 NCAA football. You know, that's you're not even even the guys that were on the the mediocre NCAA like D1 teams. They're not really filling crowds. Well, exactly. Like looking look at our interview last week with David Pendel. Where he talked about when he played for UConn, which was a D one school, pretty recognized school, and he said that they didn't fill out their stadiums. Yeah. Where a lot of their games, their the crowds are very mediocre. So if you're if you're a player like that on the Guardians and you're walking into uh, St. Louis, a hyped up crowd. There's going to be some eggs planted in your head. You know, that's it, it's such a psychological part of the game. And, and a lot of people just, there's still some adjusting that needs to be done because really the XFL fans have, have really impressed me. And, and I love just all the people dressing up. Mm-hmm. You know, there was in the Dragons game, there was a group of people dressed in like dragon costumes. It's just a lot of fun. There was a, there was a guy in the Battle Hawks game with like a, 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 like a beak. And like wild hair, there was a guy in the dragons game. He had like a a spiky mohawk that was dyed orange and green for the for the dragons. Just the amount of of intensity and the and just the dedication that these fans are showing in week three. Mm-hmm. And I mean, it was it was there from week one. That's where the that's where the XFL is going to find its success. You know, when when you're watching at home on TV and you're you're kind of lukewarm about it, and you see fans getting that into in, mm-hmm. into it. It just makes you want to get more into your team and, and really uh, gets you excited. And I think that's really um, the XFL needs to sell itself as a fan experience. This is for the love of football. It's for the fans. It's really the game has been optimized for the fans, with, with, especially with the access, the, the on-field interviews and all that. And just seeing those fans dressing up and getting excited and, and treating this like um, – like th- this has been their team for life, even though like they just learned about this team like within the last two years and they've seen this team play for three weeks. It's just electric. And that St. Louis Battle Hawks, I think, was one of the best crowds we've seen so far. I agree. And looking ahead to next week, too, a game where I think the crowd is going to be amazing is the Dallas Houston game. So oh, you got yeah. the Battle of Texas there. That's going to be the best rivalry in this league, I believe. Mm-hmm. And, and it'll be interesting to see that game because, I mean, um, P.J. Walker is going to be good. We know that. But the questionable thing is the Dallas Renegades because, I mean, they've kind of had a habit of not doing well in the first couple of quarters and then the second half really turning it into, into fourth gear and, and getting it done. Um, that just doesn't work when you're playing the Houston Roughnecks who are just consistently good and just keep – keep adding to their lead. Um, it's going to be very interesting to see how Dallas responds. I think they need to run the ball early as the commentators were talk- talking about in the end of the Dragons game. They really need, because their run game's wor- working really well. And I think the temptation when you have a guy like Landry Jones is to, is to let him throw. But at the same time, um, what's working is the running game. And they're only, re- like, they're only resorting to it late in the games. Mm-hmm. And in the late of the games, when they resort to it, they find success. It's kind of, it's almost like a batter um, who like who shortens up when he has two strikes against him, but because he's a better hitter when he shortens up, he always gets his hits with two strikes. Mm-hmm. So it's almost better for him to shorten up right right off the get go, and and then he he can find his hits early in at bats. It's it's the same thing with the Dallas Renegades in their run game. They really need to to learn to to lean on it a little bit more and to understand that 
Uh, Landry Jones, yes, he's a great he's a great quarterback, but he's not very mobile, and he's he hasn't been amazing yet. Mm-hmm. And ov- overall, my opinion on the XFL: three weeks in, I was a little scared. We were really hyped for the first week. I was a little scared that a couple weeks in it was going to lose its excitement. I was going to lose interest in it. And we wouldn't be able to talk about it as much on this. But so mm-hmm. far, I'm just as excited as I was the first week. And I think it's it's going to continue to grow. Yeah, for sure. Now, let's get to the Dragons game. What were your thoughts <laughs> on that? Uh, I mean, they they let us down. It's a, It was a tough game. I think the Dragons are going to have a tough year. Brandon Silvers, he's a very, I would say, mediocre quarterback. And there's some situations where... He'll look really good in, in a couple throws, and then he'll turn around and he'll just throw a 95-mile-an-hour ball at a guy two feet away from him mm-hmm. for absolutely no reason, and it just kills the drive. You know, and, 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 but it's one of those things. If you're Jim Zorn, right, there's two, there's two things you can do here in this situation, right? You can, one, you can panic. Mm-hmm. Or two, you can say, okay, it's still early. What do we learn from these losses? And how, what adjustments can be made? And I think really with, when you're talking about him just hucking those ball, putting too much oomph in the ball, he's five yards away, and he's just bouncing the ball off the receiver's hands because he's throwing so hard. Mm-hmm. That's, a, that's a small adjustment. That's, mm-hmm. a, that's a really small adjustment. And, and it, it just takes – if you panic – you're not going to make those small adjustments. If you if you step back and say we still have a we have a good shot at the season, we just need to make some adjustments. Um, that's that's a big change, and that changes. There's so many drives that ended because he just overthrew the ball. You know, so mm-hmm. I think I think there's a lot of it, yes, it looks pretty bleak for the Dragons right now, but at the same time, I think and another big adjustment that needs to be made. Uh, we were talking about this before the sh- we started the show. And there would just be times where half, more than half the Dragons team would be on one side of the field and the defenders would just, or the, sorry, the Renegades would just take advantage and cut through that side. And there's like two defenders over mm-hmm. there, you know, and, and really, I don't know what they're trying. I, they're maybe they're trying to be a little bit cheeky, kind of guess which way they're going, but it's just not working. And when that happens multiple times in a game on big drives where you need big stops, um, that's the difference between winning a football game and losing a football game. They need to go back to the drawing board on some of these defensive plays and, and really balance out who's on, like where people are on the field. I, I agree. I agree. And, and two, as you were saying with the Silvers there, I think after you get to game five, if, this, yeah, if he, his play doesn't really improve, I think you got to move to B.J. Daniels on the bench because he's a proven quarterback. He, mm-hmm. He's got more experience in Silvers. He's, got the, he's more athletic, and I think he could do good in this league. So and, and I think I think you got to have the short leash, knowing that you mm-hmm. have him on the bench. You know, and and, and it's interesting um, how the commentators were saying at halftime when when Silvers was looking pretty good, Dragons were off to a hot start. They were saying, "It's funny how last week we were talking about should Brandon Silvers be benched in this game, and now this week we're talking about how good he's been. Man, he should have been benched in that fourth quarter. You know." Mm-hmm. Because you don't forget, too, the Seattle Dragons are one and two, but in the game that they won, Silver's threw for less than 100 yards. Yeah, yeah. And, and another interesting thing about, about last Saturday's game was um, the Dragons really are a heavy rushing team. Like they drafted a couple of really good running backs early, but we haven't gotten much production out of them. Gardner got 37 yards, William got 33 yards. You know, that's, those are not great numbers. No, no you, you, need, team, you need better than that. If for you, a team, if you, yeah, for a team that was n- like on week one, it was clear this is a rushing heavy team. Um, really, ha- they don't have much to show for it so far, especially in that last game. Mm-hmm. I agree. It's going to be interesting to see where they go from here. 